Today, as we come to the table, whoever had the strongest opinion, that's what mattered. And here's, here's the mindset. I know I'm keep driving this home, but this is the mindset we've got to have as the church of today, even if we're not the last generation, which I think we are, but even if we're not, only God knows, with the world we're living in today, we have got to realize that our opinions don't matter and the world's opinions don't matter. Not in a mean way, not in a bad way, but only in relation to truth. Yes, our opinion matters in what restaurant we want to eat at or how we want to view. I know that. But when it comes to eternal truth, this is too important to base what we believe on opinions. Is everybody with me? Pastor Mark tells us today that your opinion matters when it comes to what to eat or what to wear. But when it comes to eternity and truth, your opinion doesn't mean a thing. There's a higher truth than what you feel like believing today. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Everyone has an opinion that they're shouting at the top of their lungs like the loudest person is going to win. But the truth is... There is truth out there, and we can only find it in Scripture. My opinion, your opinion, they they don't matter. They're ideas. Everybody has them. Meh. If you want to know the truth, stop listening to the shouts of men and listen to the whisper of God. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Acts chapter 17 as he continues his message. More Noble-Minded. So we'll move up to Acts chapter 17. As we look today at being more noble-minded, I want to start out just reading a few verses here at the beginning, and then, as always, we'll pray and ask God to bless it. We need the Lord to really anoint this. So notice, now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, And saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word this morning. What an important portion of scripture this is, especially, Lord, for our day, where there are so many opinions out there. There are so many viewpoints of right and wrong. And God, it is only by the scriptures that we find the truth, and it is only by reasoning from the scriptures that we have the authority and the power, Lord, to show it. And so, God, I pray that you would just continue to prepare us, as I believe, the end times church, so that we can be ready, Lord, to be a witness and a testimony in the days in which we live. And so, Lord, I ask you to pour out your spirit on us. I pray you would teach us. I pray, God, you would instruct us. And, Lord, I pray that by the time we're done today, we would be like the Bereans and be more noble-minded, that is, standing on your word And Lord, being able with authority to reason from the scriptures. So I just pray you would teach us now, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. More noble minded. Now, today, guys, in this passage here, we see Paul begin in Thessalonia and end in Berea. And as he starts in Thessalonia and then moves his way to Berea, we're going to see two very different groups of Christians. They're both Christians. And we're going to find out that those in Thessalonica were not as noble-minded as the way the Bible says it. It's those in Berea. And why is that reason? Simply because they were faithful to search the scriptures to see if these things be so. And so there are, I find these same groups of Christians around today. There are groups of Christians that simply believe everything the pastor says. And then there are groups of Christians who have to find it in the scriptures to believe that it's true. And I think that if we had to be stuck in one category, I hope that where we find ourselves at Calvary Chapel is in the category that if I can't find it in the Word of God, I'm not going to believe it. Nothing personal against Pastor Mark, but I want to see it in the Word of God. And that is the difference in these two groups. And guys, listen, this is such an important portion of Scripture. Understand this. I believe that if we don't grasp this and if we don't apply this to our lives, we're not going to make it in the last days. And I personally believe we're living in the last days. Nobody knows when the Lord's coming back. No one knows the day or the hour. We don't know that. But the Lord did say we would know the signs of the times and we'd be able to recognize the season. 
And I believe we see the signs of the times and the season upon us for the last days, which means we need to be prepared. You know, the Bible says in the last days, note this, there will be a great falling away. And it's talking about the church. What it means is there's going to be a lot of people in the church who are going to fall away. Now, it doesn't tell us whether or not it's, you know, referring necessarily to some type of salvation argument or that kind of thing. What it's saying is there's going to be a great deception in the last days. And unless you know the word of God, you're going to be sucked into it and be pulled away. It's interesting. The Bible says this, my people, not the people of the world, my people perish due to a lack of, isn't that great? You fill in the blank. Why? Because you see how important that is. My people, he's not talking about the world, guys. We're the ones that if we don't know the word of God, the Bible says we can perish. We can be pulled away. We can be pulled astray. And the Bible says there will be a great falling away. And I believe I see the great falling away underway today. And Mark, what do you mean by that? The churches are still full. That's right. But you know what's happening? There's a great falling away from the word of God. And because there's a great falling away from the word of God, the church doesn't know the Word of God like it used to. Guys, this is not our Father's America. Maybe you've noticed that. And the reason being is, is because we used to have churches that were based on the Word of God, and people knew the Word of God, and they believed it. We have to be those who know the Word of God and stand on it. If we're going to survive personally in our life and our walk, but if we're going to be used to reach the world around us, we have to know it as well. So I have a, a twofold heart for you this morning. I want you to know the Word of God so you can reach the world, but I don't want you guys to fall away. I don't want anybody in this room to be a casualty. And the bottom line is we're in warfare. And the enemy is going to bring things. The Bible says it's going to get so weird in the last days. Get this, that there are going to be miracles that Satan brings. Miracles. We're going to see miracles that the Antichrist does, that the false prophet does. They're going to do things that can't happen in the natural realm. It is undeniably supernatural. And if we don't know that the Bible warns us that God is going to allow Satan to work supernaturally through them, if we don't have the knowledge of God good enough to know that, what are we going to do when we see that? A lot of the church is going to fall for it. They're going to say, well, that was real. So it has to be God. Wrong. They're right about the first part. It will be very real, but it will not be God. It'll be the enemy. And guys, we have got to be Bereans, and we'll get to what Bereans are as we get into this today. I've kind of let the cat out of the bag, but the bottom line is, is the Bereans were people that didn't just believe what the pastor said. They didn't believe it until they saw it in the Bible. Great, Mark. I'm glad about your opinion. Everybody's got one. I'm glad about your opinion. That's nice. Show me where that is in the Bible. And guys, this is the danger we live in in our society today. Because we've removed the Bible in large part, we don't have a standard of truth anymore. So it depends on one or two things. Whoever's the most educated or whoever has the most convincing opinion. Listen, please don't be offended by this. But our opinions don't matter to God. Only the truth does. I'm not trying to be abrasive by that statement, but I'm trying to shock you a little bit. Here's my point. Our opinions don't make truth. Truth is what it is. Our opinions are simply that. They are opinions. And if we don't realize, okay, I've got to separate my opinion from the truth. I've got to separate the world's opinion from the truth. We're going to be led astray. How do we know the truth? The truth is the word of God. Jesus said, I am the truth. He said, nobody goes to the Father except by me. I am the truth. You want to know the truth? You'll, you'll follow me. And people scoff at that today. Even back then, what did Pilate do? Jesus said, you know what? Those who hear my voice, those who know truth, hear my voice. He said, truth. What is truth? You see, they had the same problem in the days of Rome. It was opinion. Whoever had the strongest opinion, that's what mattered. And here's, what, here's the mindset. I know I'm keep driving this home. But this is the mindset we've got to have as the church of today, even if we're not the last generation, which I think we are. But even if we're not, only God knows with the world we're living in today, we have got to realize that our opinions don't matter and the world's opinions don't matter. Not in a mean way, not in a bad way, but only in relation to truth. Yes, our opinion matters in what restaurant we want to eat at or how we want to view. I know that. But when it comes to eternal truth, this is too important to base what we believe on opinions. Is everybody with me? I'll give you, let me give you a physical illustration of this because it's deadly as a nation, it's deadly as an individual, and we've got to make sure we can separate opinion from what the truth has to be. If I take out a revolver and I load every single round in it except for one, I leave one empty, and I spin it and hand it to somebody, say, all right, now put it to that person's head and shoot, but before you shoot or put it to his head, we'll let, we'll let you decide whether or not they're going to shoot, all right? I want to get a couple of opinions about what you think. You first, I'm going to tell me your opinion. Do you think that there's, a, there's going to be a round in that chamber and this will kill them? 
Well, you know, I'm very educated in guns. I've been studying guns for many years. And uh, I know everything about them. I, I'm regular at the range. I'm an expert in that. And from the way they spun that and snapped it back in, I would say, no, that does not have a chamber in it. That's, I have a strong opinion about that. All right, great. Let me ask you, know, what's your opinion on that? Well, I'll tell you what. My opinion is you better not take a chance. <laughs> because what I think I know or don't know, if I'm wrong, you're dead. So what I would say is don't do it. You turn to the person and say, all right, which one do you want to do? Say, are you going to go with the person who's well-educated, well-trained, and has a very uh, you know, a, a respectable opinion? Are you going to go with something you know you better have the facts before somebody pulls that trigger? Look, if you've got any brains at all, you're going to find the facts before they pull that trigger. The bottom line is you can't take a chance on that. How much more important is eternity? We're, that's a physical thing. What about eternity? Well, my opinion is that, well, my opinion is, well, you know what? We better find out what God said. Because that's the only place we're going to be able to stand. Everybody's going to have a viewpoint. Everybody's going to have an opinion. And I want you to know something. If you're feeling offended when I say your opinion doesn't matter, let me be the first to say, my opinion matters not. Mark Kirk's opinion doesn't matter at all when it comes to truth. And when you stand before God on Judgment Day, it makes no difference. If you stand before the Lord and say, but Pastor Mark said, he's going, whoa, whoa, okay, I'm, I'm talking to him in a minute. Right now, it's you. Why did you believe that? Well, because Pastor Mark said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm talking to him in a minute, I said. I don't care what Pastor Mark thought, not in a mean way, but it's you that I'm worried. Why did you think that, and why did you do that? That wasn't right. Why did you do that? Well, because that's what he said. I, I thought maybe that, no, you've got to look at the Scripture yourself and find out what it says. Never base your life off of any pastor, any teacher. God is going to hold you accountable, not for what Pastor Mark taught on Sunday morning. God's going to hold you accountable for what you saw in the Word of God yourself and what you did with it. That's what He's going to hold you accountable for. So it doesn't matter how good the teacher, how knowledgeable the person, we all make mistakes. Listen, with our best intentions, we make mistakes. I'm never going to intentionally lie to you guys. But there's no doubt there's going to be times, even going through the word line by line and verse by verse, there's going to be some things that may not be 100% accurate. Now, hopefully it won't be essential issues. But I'm not foolish enough to think that everything we cover, I'm exactly 100% right. Then we have a whole other issue to deal with, right? Pride. But the bottom line is, there's going to be times where people, even with their best intentions, are going to say something that may not be right. You've got to go to the Word of God yourself and find out what is right and what is wrong. And if you don't, you're going to be held accountable to the Lord. Either way, you're going to be held accountable. And guys, this is so important. The example I gave you is physical. We're talking about eternity here. This is an eternal decision and eternal things that you're making. Now, as we get into this today, we're going to see, as I said, these two different groups of believers. We're going to see one group of believers who just believed everything Paul said. Big mistake. Aren't you glad it was Paul? What if it had been a false teacher? What if a false teacher shows up and you believe everything they say? No, that's a bad category to be in, even as a real believer. Now, here's the other category. Other, that was the Thessalonians. Here's the other category, the Bereans. And we'll get to them in a moment. The Bereans didn't believe everything Paul said. They didn't necessarily doubt him or think he was lying or doing anything on purpose that was wicked. But they said, you know what? We're going to go to the Bible, and unless we see it in the Bible, we're not going to believe it. Guys, we need to be those unless we see it in the Bible. I'm not talking about a doubting Thomas when it comes to faith or, Lord, unless I see the Lord risen, I won't believe. No, that's a whole different category. We're talking about what's in the Word of God and what has been delivered to us. And if we can't see it in the Word of God, we should have nothing to do with it because we're going to get ourselves in trouble if we do. Now, notice this story. It starts out again with Paul traveling from where he is uh, in Philippi going on to, again, Thessalonica. Uh, chapter 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, this is key here, because remember, we saw in Philippi there was no synagogue of the Jews. It's about a 100-mile journey. And we made the point that unless there were at least 10 Jewish males, they wouldn't have a synagogue. They wouldn't even put one together. You would go and just worship wherever, oftentimes down by the river, which is where he found Lydia, if you remember, and the other women that were worshiping because the men were, were gone. Probably Rome had run all the men, the Jewish men out. They were scattering them to different parts of the uh, empire and harassing the Jews, if you will, because of their beliefs. But we saw the women down there. They would go near water where they could do all their ritualistic things. But now we come to a town that actually has a synagogue, Thessalonica, which shows there was a larger Jewish population. And we're going to see as was normally what Paul did, he goes in to share with the Jews. Notice verse 2. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them, note this, from 
the scriptures. Now, there's several things to, to make note of. Number one here, notice it says, as his custom was. That is, everywhere Paul went, the first thing he did was look for a synagogue. And then first he would go into the synagogue to share the gospel with the Jews. Why? Because the Bible says that the Messiah was sent first to the Jew and then the Gentile. So you see the early church when it began was focusing it on the Jew initially. And then as the Jews rejected, it switched over to the Gentiles, which is us. But Paul followed this pattern. This was his way to go to the Jews, to try to reason with them, to make sense with them, and to bring them into the kingdom. And sadly, there were very few that did. And by the way, because there were so few that did, and they rejected the Lord as a nation, Paul tells us in Romans that God has temporarily blinded the eyes of the Jewish people. Their eyes have been temporarily blinded so that for the most part, they can't believe until the very end, when the Bible says God will pour out His Spirit once again on the Jews and on the nation of Israel, and there will be a great revival. Now, is there a remnant? Obviously, there's a remnant. And we're going to see that some do believe, but the majority of them don't. But now, here's a couple of things to note about this. When it says Paul reasoned with them, take note of this. The first thing I want you to note is this, that Christianity is a faith of reason. A lot of people try to say that Christianity is just a blind leap of faith or a blind leap of this. There's nothing blind leap about it. If you look at the facts of what the Bible says and you look at the facts of what has happened in history, it's very believable and very reasonable. You mean to tell me it's reasonable that a man raised from the dead? Well, if you've got 500 witnesses saying they saw him, that's pretty reasonable to me. And the Bible says they were, for the most part, all still alive when Paul was writing this. So had it been false, it would have been easy to run it down and find out it was a big lie. And the fact that the 11 closest followers of the Lord in the world, they all gave their life, except for John, who survived on the island of Patmos, they gave their life for the Lord in believing because they had seen him and they knew him. Listen, this is a reasonable faith. It's reasonable to believe what happened because the historical evidence is in place. But the second thing I want you to notice about the reasoning here is that notice what, how he reasoned with them. And guys, this is key for us in our day more than ever, especially with all the opinions that are out there. Notice it says he reasoned with them from the scriptures. There's your starting point. I cringe when I see believers in front of the camera or the microphone. And I know it's just we're all at different places. I'm not saying they did something wrong. It's just I want to help them. Because I see oftentimes whenever you're asked as a Christian about an argument, maybe it's a cultural issue. What do you think about, you know, name any of same-sex marriage? Or what do you think about abortion? Or what do you think about? And all these issues that are out in our society today, and they all come up. What do Christians think about them? Listen, if all we say is this, well, my viewpoint is this, and I think it's wrong because I was raised in a Christian home, and my parents believed it was wrong, and I've always just kind of felt in my heart that it was wrong. Does that have any power at all? Zero. No power. Why? It's just an opinion. Now the next guy goes, well, I was raised in a home that wasn't Christian, and we believe in all these things, and we think it's okay, and I've never seen anything to say that it's wrong. They seem to really care about each other, or they seem to have been born that, whatever the reason might be that's floating around for the different excuses or whatever. And then the next, well, that sounds like a good argument to me. And everybody's out there going, well, I guess we just picked the best opinion, right? How different it is to say, well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse so-and-so, it says this. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse that. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse that. You see the difference in the power? There's some authority. The Word of God says it. Now, that doesn't mean the world is going to bow down and go, well, we believe the Bible, but that's the authority is the Word of God. Here's my point in this. If we're going to be sharing with people and, and reasoning with them to bring them into the kingdom and try to show what is right and wrong in our society today, it has to come from the basis of the Scriptures. It has to come from the basis of the Bible because our opinion doesn't matter. Everybody has opinions. We have to find out what the truth is. And Jesus said, he is the truth. He said, I'm the truth. He said, I'm the one. You've got to come to me. And so the ultimate authority is the word of God. And that's where we have to stand. By the way, that's why the Bible is so attacked. Why do you think the Bible is so attacked? Satan zeroes in on the Bible. And why does he zero in on the Bible? Well, the Bible was written by man. Well, the Bible has errors. Well, the bottom line is I've never seen anybody that could find an error in the Bible. And it can't be written by man because it's too supernatural and contains prophecy which has predicted the future and up to this point has been 100% accurate. And yet even in the so-called scientific community, the big attack, well, we've proven scientifically. I have a question for you. How, many, how often are the science, the science books updated? <laughs> even in our universities because they find errors and mistakes in things they were wrong about. Every year they have to update them. Every year. And quite frankly, on a monthly basis. Now let me ask you another question. How often has the Bible had to be updated? Never. Which one do you think you stand on more solid ground with, gang? And yet we get intimidated. Well, I'm afraid because 
his name says professor and he's got a white coat on. You know, well, maybe they just wrap him up in it and take him somewhere, you know. <laughs> because the word of God says this. And it has stood the test of time. And Jesus Christ said that it was God's word and that it was true and that it would be eternal. We have solid ground to stand on. We have nothing to be afraid of. But if we take our argument to the world, if we take our reasoning to the world based on our opinion, what we believe at Calvary Chapel or what we believe as Christians or what my pastor said, they don't care. There's no power. And you know what? They're right. But if we go and we say, Jesus Christ said this. It says this in chapter that, verse that. Now there's power, and whether or not they acknowledge it, they may not like it, the power still exists. You know, Pilate denied it. Jesus said, those who hear my voice, they know truth. It, <laughs> what's truth? He mocked it. What's truth? And yet he was still afraid of the Lord, wasn't he? It says Pilate feared the Lord, and he tried from that point on to release him because he knew there's something, there's a power here, and I don't like this, I don't agree with it, there's a power here. When you guys stand on the word of God, there's a power that can't be denied. It's the true power of God. And so we have to stand on it and use it. And so again, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Look at verse 3, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Now, why would that be such an important message to the Jews? Because the Jews didn't believe the Messiah had to die. They believed the Messiah was going to come back, and when he did, he would rule the world. That is why so many Jews didn't believe in Jesus, because their pastors were teaching them that when the Messiah came, he would take the world over. The problem they had was they were listening to their pastors rather than reading the word of God for themselves. And had they read Isaiah chapter 52 at the end and Isaiah chapter 53, they would have seen the Messiah had to suffer. And if they'd read Psalm 22 on their own, they would have seen that he had to die and, and resurrect again. And had they looked at the scripture, they'd have seen all this, but they didn't. They just believed their pastor. They were like the Thessalonians, but they weren't like the Bereans. He was explaining and demonstrating to them from the scriptures what it is the Bible says has to happen, and that's where the power lies. And look at the result of it. Verse 4, and some, I have that underlined, were persuaded. How sad that only some were persuaded. Why? Because they had been taught so much throughout their life that the Messiah would not die but would rule and reign when he came. That'll happen the second time. But because they didn't know the Bible good enough, what? My people perish due to a lack of knowledge. And today the Jews are still perishing in mass because they don't know the word of God. Now, there's some that are saved. Praise the Lord for that. There's a remnant. And we're going to see a great revival among them in the very end. But here only some believed. But look at this. Now, God moving among the Gentiles who didn't have their preconceived notions. They just believed the word of God. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks. Notice they believed. And not a few of the leading women. Joining Paul and joining Silas. So again, God was moving among them. Note this. Now, there's a result here. But the Jews who were not persuaded becoming envious, took some evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Now, it's amazing. Notice this. They don't like what they're saying. They become envious and they attack them. Guys, note this. When people become envious of you, the attack is on the way. Some of you this morning may be under attack. You know, why is it that I'm being so attacked? Why is this happening in my life? Well, if you, if you find out that there's no real reason for you to be attacked, then probably it's because somebody's jealous. Probably it's because somebody's envious. You've got something they want. You look away, they want to look. You've, whatever the case might be, they're upset because you're more popular or whatever. You know, we see that at the immature level in the junior high and high school, but it also happens among adults. And just like that, another time at the table of God's Word has come to an end. The accounts of this book end up being the types of storylines that directors long for in a good plot of an underdog overcoming the odds and doing more than people would ever expect. But like many stories, they don't always have a happy ending, at least here on Earth. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of Acts next time. But you don't have to wait until then to listen to more great Bible studies. You can access this series in the Come to the Table section on thewaymedia.net. Feel free to share these messages with anyone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. You can also download the Way Media app to access teachings as they're available. If you live in the Knoxville area, you're invited to join Pastor Mark and the community of Jesus followers at Calvary Knoxville for our next service. For nearly 25 years, it's been incredible to see how God 
God has used us in our local community and through this radio outreach, there's always a seed for you. We meet Saturdays at 6 p.m., Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30, or 11.15, and in the evening again at 6. We also gather Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. If you can't make it in person, that's not a problem. You can join us online. We're streaming our services through the Way Media app. To find out more info on Calvary Knoxville, scroll to the bottom of the waymedia.net to find the link to our church website. Pastor Mark has more to share, so be sure to join us as we prepare to come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.